This is Bump and Beyond with Yulandi Becker, the show about pregnancy and babies. 101.9 megahertz of life. Yes, welcome, welcome, welcome. You are on Bump and Beyond, and this is 101.9 High FM. I am your host, Yulandi Becker, and this show is all about parenting. And today we are really focusing on the emotional part of parenting. As parents, we are often way too hard on ourselves. We might compare ourselves with other parents, sometimes our own parents, and judge ourselves too harshly. And that is absolutely natural. I think as human beings, we try to do our very best and we want to improve ourselves, but we are tend to have a tendency, especially as parents, to think we're not doing it well. And I mentioned now as well, comparing ourselves with our own parents. And to be honest, I always imagine imagine your parents were actually the perfect parents <laughs> because they were not. There's no such things, let's face it, as the perfect parents. So imagine that your parents were the perfect parents. How hard would this journey be then? So you don't want to be a perfect parent because then technically you are putting that pressure on your own children to live up to. So in essence, what I'm saying is, don't be the perfect parent because you're going to screw your kids up even more. And that's not something we want to have. But we've all heard it. It's like, oh, rest when your baby rests. Take care of yourself. Um, you can't take care of your child when you can't take care of yourselves. But in the hustle and bustle of parenting, who has, if you're in it, especially the first time, it's such an abrupt change to your life that becomes so difficult because you want to sometimes clean something when your baby is sleeping just to feel a little bit more productive because you're thinking in the end you're just doing that. You want to talk to other people when your child is sleeping so that you can just have an adult conversation. So it is not as always or not as straightforward as rest when your baby is resting or taking care of yourself before you take care of your baby. It's it, the reality of it is not that, even though it should be, because you should be taking care of yourself because that will make you a better per a person and a better per parent. Look at me, tongue twisting already this morning. Raising children is an important job and looking after yourself helps to do your job well. That's because looking after yourself physically, mentally, and emotionally helps to give your children what they need to grow and thrive. When you focus on when you focus on looking after your child or your baby, it's easy to forget or run out of time to look after the parts of your life that are those physical, mental, and emotional things you need to take care of for yourself. But Looking after yourself is worth it. It's good for you and it is good for your child. And that's what I want to talk to you about today is how do you make the time to take emotionally? Because sometimes I also think we're overthinking it a little bit. And it's not about going to a spa every day. No, not at all. Who has the time for all the money for that these days? <laughs> but it is, you can have easy in stuff to implement to help that emotional journey. And I'm going to be talking to an expert about exactly that today. Looking after yourself involves looking after not only yourself, but also your relationships. Also something that I want to talk about today, your health and your well-being. And let's get into it with Dr. Yakumin Miller. She has a PhD and so that's why I said doctor, <laughs> um, a PhD in psychology, and is the mom of two. Hello, Yakumin. Hello, Yolandi. I'm very happy to be here today. Um, like I said, I feel parenting is not as easy and straightforward uh, um, always um, as just being good and having the time to do everything. So I very much look forward to our conversation just now. This is Bump and Beyond with Yulandi Becker, the show about pregnancy and babies, 101.9 megahertz of life. 
So if you've just joined us, you are on 101.9 High FM and I'm your host, Yonani Becker on Bump and Beyond. If you've missed the intro to my show, you've missed my emotional rant <laughs> of wanting to take care of yourselves. And, um, and like I said earlier, in the end of the day, we've all heard it. Rest when your baby rests and all those things. And the reality, though, of parenting is, is that it's not that easy. And I can recall being in a very dark place <laughs> when I was sleeping and uh, or not sleeping. That's actually what uh, um, because and that's kind of where my journey also obviously with my business started is the fact that I wasn't sleeping. And then when I started sleeping better, I had such a significant improvement on my well-being that it changed everything what I did. So joining me today, like I said um, earlier, is Dr. Yes, she has a PhD in psychology, Dr. Yakumin Miller. Hello again, Yakumin. Thank you for joining me. Um, and we've actually had quite a journey together, you and me, uh, as you finished <laughs> um, <laughs> a, a study on the emotional well-being of parents before and after sleep interventions. Um, so first of all, tell me, how, how do you start with that? How do you get into, or let me rather say, when embarking on a study, what do you have to keep in mind? Let's think of that first. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> yeah, there's quite a lot that you have to keep in mind. Obviously, you have to have a valid research question and something that there is a gap in the knowledge base, which you want to address. But you have to plan your methodology or the way you go about your research very carefully. So what exactly is the information that you're wanting to find or that you're hoping to find? You must be aware of the hope because it might bias your, your information. Um, but you need to consider the sample size, you need to consider access to your participants, you need to consider the reliability and the validity of your study. So not just of the measures you're using, but of the questions you're asking as well. It doesn't help to ask a question that is not related to your research question. Um, and then obviously, very importantly, you need to consider the ethics of your study. So in this regard, you mustn't do harm to your participants, you must um, be confidential or maintain confidentiality with the information. Um, participants have to give informed consent. Um, but all of this is also geared through the university's processes to ensure that everything is on standard and above board. Now that you mention it, also, like you said, the ethics part of it, and I remember all the questions and disclaimers <laughs> we had to include <laughs> in <Yes>. our questionnaires <laughs> with regards to that. But even before that, um, I've participated or not participated, let me rather, I've been um, at the receiving end where people have disclosed also their research findings. And I was always surprised um, or then surprised of how difficult it is because people I don't think realize this is that lots of the information, especially when it comes to children, is very and the research is very lacking out there yeah. because of this ethical issue. Um, yeah. Because you can't just do a study on children and without their consent because they're children, obviously. And there's a lot of ethical loops you have to run through. So for me, Often people see research that they've read on the internet or something, and then they base their decision of parenting on this research. And in the end, if you really go look at the study, it's literally three kids in somewhere that they did research or 10 kids that they did research on coincidentally. What are these kind of ethical, just, I, I mean, I know there's a lot, but what are some of these ethical things that you have to consider? Yeah, so research on children is very difficult. Obviously, you need parental consent, um, and it takes months of ethical clearance and jumping through the specific loopholes to make sure that your study is above board. Um, you're talking about sample sizes, and that's very important. You can't really generalize to the broader population with a sample size of 10, yeah. for example. So that's very important that you have an adequate sample size. And Whenever we publish studies, we always have to include limitations as well. What have we not considered or what are the limitations of our studies mm. so that the readers will understand that the study isn't without limitation. Yeah. Another important thing that you, you mentioned now is people read research on, I suppose, presumably the internet. 
um, because the majority of the people are not subscribed to scientific journals. Yes. Um, so I will just also caution individuals to not do their research on YouTube shorts or TikTok or <laughs> anything like that. Um, use Google Scholar um, at the very least, but make sure that where you receive your information is from a peer-reviewed academic journal because that is the information that is valid and reliable. The rest is opinions only and not relevant to your life necessarily. I am looking forward to all my questions because now we're just <laughs> touching, I feel, the iceberg of um, this whole conversation. Um, and I'm pretty sure we're going to be running out of time, which is always for me disappointing, but today even more so because I know what you've done with this study and, and, and. So I'm looking forward to getting into it a lot more. This is Bump and Beyond with Yolandi Becker. The show about pregnancy and babies, 101.9 megahertz of life. I am chatting with Dr. Jakumin Miller about various things. As I mentioned earlier, um, I was talking a lot about the emotional side of parenting. And I think that is an important note to mention of because you are a psycho. Obviously, this was a PhD in <laughs> psychology. So we have to include the emotional part of that and that's kind of why it started as well for me personally as I mentioned parenting was not as not always and that's for me the funny part and I think or the hard part rather of parenting is that I have realized now and I've only been a parent for 11 years not longer than that is that it is really okay to feel very conflicting emotions at the very same time. And I think that's what sometimes makes it so tiring because you're feeling so overwhelmed and grateful to be a parent and you love it. And at the same time, you are annoyed like crazy or ticked off or whatever the conflicting emotion is. And your brain is trying to kind of balance this out. And when you throw something in like lack of sleep or lack of support or something like this, I think it makes this journey so much harder. And again, Yakumin, where tell us a little bit about this specific study that you did. Okay, so this study was specifically about the influence of behavioral sleep intervention, so colloquially termed sleep training the implementation of these interventions, whether they're successful or not, doesn't matter, just the implementation, how does it affect parental well-being? So that was what we were interested in. And we looked at five different constructs. We looked at perceived stress, we looked at life satisfaction, we looked at positive and negative effect emotions, and then we looked at postnatal depression and couple satisfaction. And we looked at how it's changed from before, so we have did a pre-test, post-test design. Before the intervention, we measured parents on all these constructs. And then after the intervention, about two months after the intervention, we measured them again to see how they changed after the implementation of the interventions. So specifically also now mentioned before, like sample size as well isn't important because in the end, like I said, I've, I have for sure read research studies where it's like five or 10 babies that you look at. And like you said, then you have to look at the limitations of the study because you can't necessarily like broadly say oh, all children then is doing this because you don't have that. I think there's also other limitations. I remember the other day looking at stats that someone was releasing on, and obviously this is out of medical things, where they were saying that a certain amount of alcohol obviously leads to alcohol fetal syndrome. And then I was like thinking, obviously they must have had medical information to get that because no one will willingly participate in that study. <laughs> no parents. <laughs> So the other limitations can also have um have a, what do you call it impact, but yeah. yes. But what I wanted to say now is, in the end of the day, what was the sample size you were looking at? How many people did you interview, in essence, or how many questions? Uh, okay, so let me just also mention my study was what we call a mixed method study. So we did a quantitative side where participants um, filled in 
specific questionnaires that were valid and reliable. Um, it's very frequently used, those questionnaires. And then we did a qualitative component where I asked certain participants information for, for further information in interviews afterwards. Um, so the total participants was, I'm speaking under correction, this was a while ago, I think it was 121 participants oh. that we had in total. Yeah. Oh. So 121 okay. participants, of which I then had interviews with 12 individuals. Because from a qualitative perspective, you are finding out quite a lot more information, especially those confounding variables that you were talking about. If you, for example, had a bad night's sleep the day, the night before you were answering questionnaires, it might skew the data. So it's important to, to triangulate your data and make sure that when you ask participants questions, they must reflect on um, how they were feeling. And so you go into a lot more depth with the qualitative interviews, and then you can get a lot more information in that way. Before we now get to the whole results, how did you personally actually decide on this topic? Was it just because, <laughs> oh, I have to look for something? Was it coincidence or was there was there a reason? How it was definitely, it, there was definitely a reason. Uh, my children, I have twins. They did not sleep for three years. <laughs> and when I did my research, like other people do their research on the internet, um, I was too scared to try sleep training. But then I realized I am an academic. I should do my research properly. Um, and I found that what is on the internet and what is in academic journals are two very separate things. Um, and so what I also realized was, was that even in academic journals, the focus was predominantly on children and how they experienced interventions, how they improved afterwards and so on. But there was very little on the parents. And so I wanted to address this because once my children started sleeping through, um, obviously the increase in well-being, like you mentioned earlier, was, was very significant. But I was still cognizant of the impact it had on my well-being for those three years. Because like you mentioned, parenting is hard. There's this ideology of what it means to be a good parent, um, but it's completely different from what it means to be a real parent. And so it was tough. Um, and I wanted to address that and hopefully share it with other parents so that they know that there is a way to improve well-being. Um, yeah, but we were, it was exploratory research. We, we weren't sure exactly which direction it would go. So, yeah, and then the last thing is also um, some of the facets that I covered in my study, we did not, the, or research hadn't previously addressed, and also there was no research in South Africa. So, so that was essentially the the whole reason why I started. I like that there's also a personal connection. As you know, that's also for me how I got to good night in the end is that I personally was also not sleeping. And for me, there was various things. And I mean, you said that there was five facets to your your research as well that you were looking at, not just necessarily how people were feeling, but the relationship and those type of things. Because for me personally, afterwards, um, I felt empowered through the process. So it wasn't just that I was feeling much better mentally. I was really felt empowered through the knowledge that I gained and that I felt a lot more in control of what was happening. And that for me was a, a serious life-changing event, hence why this passion grew to kind of share this. And by the time you came to me to say, hey, do you want to do training? I'm like, hell yeah, I want to do this study <laughs> on it because I feel I know this makes a difference and now we can prove it. And what was the, the, the end result for the study? <laughs> So statistically significant improvement on all facets except couple satisfaction. Hmm. So couple satisfaction showed a trend towards improving, but not statistically so. So for those um, who are not in academia, when we do research, it's not enough to see that there is improvement. Uh, we have statistical formulas that we use to determine whether it's statistically significant. No. So in other words, there's definitely, it's, it's not due to other factors. Um, so all facets improved significantly. Um, the biggest improvements were seen in depression, negative effect, and perceived stress, but life satisfaction and positive emotions also improved significantly. And yeah, couple satisfaction showed a trend towards improving, but um, it wasn't statistically significant. But there's so much that goes into couple satisfaction, it's not just sleep. 
And I mean, that kind of brings me to the segue I also want to go into, because I know that you are also um, a counselor and that you do help people um, with their relationships and those type of things as well. And as you mentioned, there is a, a lot that goes on in a relationship. And even I mentioned earlier that I think that that your once you start sleeping better and your relationship, you you might you know, think it is better <laughs> um, <laughs> in some ways. But I've also seen it with clients of mine where through the process, parents realize how little the other person is doing, for instance, or how not on the same page they are. And I think those are the type of things that when you're going into parenthood that you don't necessarily realize, you think, oh, hey, we're the same religion, so we must believe the same thing or something like that type of thing where you kind of go into it and there's conversations that don't happen. I don't know, just because you probably didn't think of it. There's lots of things in parenthood, let's face it, that you can't think of before. Until you know, you don't know know. (laughs) what you're going to be. And then once you get into it, you realize, oh, it's not necessarily the case. And I think that's just why it doesn't necessarily happen, where you realize, oh, maybe we don't have the same way of disciplining our child or the same um, way of what we thought it would be equal distribution of tasks. And it's not. Um, And I think that plays a role. What are some of the other things that you feel plays a role in that the relationship doesn't just improve like that? Well, it's important to remember when you have a baby or when you adopt a child or however a child comes into your family, you are adding a third person to your relationship and they have their own thoughts, feelings, emotions and behaviours. So whereas your relationship might have been stable beforehand with a few niggles, it's going to take a little bit of a knock when you add a third person to this relationship. The responsibilities of parenting is permanent and full-time and it doesn't rest when you sleep um <laughs> unfortunately. So it is a, it, unfortunately it is a constant it is an absolute constant and that puts strain on you as well so if you were able to cope even though you hadn't didn't have the greatest communication adding a child loss of sleep or lack of sleep um and all these different facets, financial strain, all of that to your relationship, it's going to be influencing you. Parenting is stressful. There's, it's a lot of strain that is added to the family system. And any kind of stressor also influences the satisfaction of the couple. So there's so much that we need to consider. We need to consider stability in work. Um, we need to consider the ideologies of the parents, cultural differences, um, family differences, because you raise your children like you were raised more often than not. Um, we have those intergenerational similarities, but your family and your husband's or your wife's or your partner's family is not the same. And so there will be differences there. Personality differences mm-hmm. and the differences in personality between you and your child. And there's something we call the goodness of fit. How good does your child's personality fit with your personality or your partner's personality? Because if there's a big difference, it adds even more stress and strain. So I could talk about this for all day. We're going to have to have have another interview, it seems. (laughs) And if you've just joined us, you are on 101.9 High FM. This is Bump and Beyond. I'm your host, Yolani Becker. And today my expert is a serious expert, Dr. Jakobin (laughs) Miller. She does have a PhD in psychology. And we are talking about a study that she recently did um, and the subsequent consequences, I guess, of that study, um, where she studied the impact on parental well-being or um, of sleep interventions on parental well-being. And um, we were just now talking about the relationship. And because the study obviously found that it wasn't a significant impact better sleep on the relationship because as we all know and as you mentioned now is that it is more than just sleeping better that can have an impact on sleep but what are some of those healthy kind of relationship skills parents should have that can help in the end because in the end if I feel if your relationship is strong and your parenting team is strong 
it's going to filter through into your parenting with your child and their consequent perception of what healthy relationships are, I guess, as well. I guess we can have a whole different conversation on that as well. But what are some of these relationship skills parents should have? In relation to your previous question, I just want to make a small correction. So remember, there was a trend towards improvement in couple satisfaction, but it wasn't statistically significant. Yes. But all other facets of parental well-being, so stress, depression, emotions, um, and life satisfaction, those facets improved significantly because yes. of the sleep. Yes. Okay. okay. So then Correcting me on the study. I didn't do the study, <laughs> so I'm... <laughs> Apologies. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so then um, in terms of your question, healthy relationship skills, open communication is the first and foremost one. Um, without open communication and effective communication, um, relationships do run into, into trouble. And this is with your partner as well as with your child. So we must listen. We must actually hear what they say and it's helpful to reflect back um so for example you can say to your child or your partner you can say i hear you saying this am i understanding correctly um so that you are sure that you're on the same page because not everybody is a good communicator no. it's also important to not interrupt each other it's important not to talk down at each other to have respectful communication again this is both for children and for partners because i think sometimes parents have a tendency to, to forget that their children are also humans no. with their own thoughts and views and all that. Um, and parents sometimes talk down to their children um, and all of those things that annoy us in what our children do, for example, interrupting, maybe lying, maybe talking disrespectfully, we must be mindful whether we are doing it to them. And that is the example that they are then seeing. So a certain element of mindfulness in our communication is also very important. No. And I mean... I do, I, in the beginning of the show, I said that I think as parents, we are often very hard on ourselves. And um, that part where you're now saying about the communication with your partner, I I have to say that, I mean, I've been married now almost 14 years. Also, it's not, it's a long time, but it's, I know people that have been married longer, like my parents. And I have to say that I know I am better at communication with my husband now than what I was 14 years ago. And what you said about the whole mindfulness reminds me of, oh, I I've, I don't think I've ever been great. I don't think most people are not great at taking criticism and maybe criticism <laughs> is not the right word. I don't know. But if someone is telling you, hey, do you think that was the right way to handle it? I feel as human beings are immediate response is always to defend ourselves and I have learned like you say <laughs> and it doesn't and that's what I just want to put out there for pe people especially new parents or newlyweds who just had a baby or whatever is that you can luckily get better at this just because you're not great at it now doesn't mean you can't get better at it you can that's why they say that marriage is work because you are learning and continuously learning about yourself as well but being mindful, like you said, and actually listening and not taking it as criticism. I don't think criticism is the right word, but rather reminding yourself that this is a long-term thing that you're working towards together. <laughs> Absolutely. And the thing is also what can happen is that it can be our own sensitivities mm. and insecurities and worries For sure. and <laughs> that influences how we perceive what another person is saying. Yes. So sometimes it's it's helpful to get out of your own head just a little bit and take a take a, a little bit of an objective view of what is happening. But of course, it's difficult to do that in a in the moment. You know, when you're yeah. getting angry. With your I've also kind of reminded myself in the end of the day, I'm always grateful that my husband cares enough to notice if something is not the way he wants it, and then voices it because you could be in a relationship where the person just doesn't give a damn anymore. <laughs> and also what's important is that there is, there's two people in this relationship. Yes. <laughs> so it's, you won't always it's not agree. Perfect. Yeah. No, no. No, you can't and, always agree. But and also, you're humans with your own feelings. Yeah. And also, like you said, 
Um, I, I and I always end my show now that the world is changed by our example and not by our opinion. And it filled us through a little bit um, from what you just said is that sometimes we don't treat our children in the same way as what we do adults, that we don't yeah. take the time to listen to them and yeah. to give them a chance to voice their opinion. And I try, even with that, I have to say that it's a work in progress. My son is really good because I tell my children that in the end of the day, I'm glad that you give me, gave me your opinion um because i want them to be able to voice their opinion but that the consequence of that is unfortunately that they do give their opinion <laughs> <laughs> but you know what open communication is important they need to feel heard they need to feel seen yeah but there has to also be limits and boundaries and those boundaries are especially important yes um we, in all relationships we need to have boundaries yes we are in a relationship with a person and we are a unit with that person but we are also still our own person with our own thoughts and views and others must respect that. Yeah. Um, and so those boundaries are very important. Yeah. No, I, I'm loving it, but I'm noticing that we are strongly running out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but I do have some points that I want to get to and I'm excited to get to that just now. This is Bump and Beyond with Yolandi Becker. The show about pregnancy and babies, 101.9 megahertz of life. So, yes, yes, yes. As I mentioned, we are running out of time, surely, um, slowly, no, fastly. It wasn't slowly at all, <laughs> fastly and surely. Um, but if you've just joined us, you are on Bump and Beyond. I am your host, Yulandi Becker, and I'm chatting with Dr. Yakumin Miller, about her study, but also about emotional, uh, parental emotional well-being and the subsequent hopefully making your child also a little bit more secure emotionally when you are. And that reminds me of something that someone, I, and it might have been you who told me this, I can't remember, but someone once mentioned to me like, our perception as adults often when we think about being emotionally well is that it's placid emotions and that you, you know, you're always calm. That's the emotional well-being. And that's actually the wrong way <laughs> of, because you should be angry when someone punches you. You should be sad and crying or whatever when someone dies. So actually being emotionally well means having the appropriate emotional response considering the situation. Being placid and calm, I think that's the, the the definition of a psychopath, if I'm not mistaken. So we don't want to create that. So give your child the um, opportunity to have their emotions. It does seem like I've missed Yakumin again now. Self-compassion helps you to be kinder um, and uh, to yourself and to navigate the challenges of raising children and is good for you and your child. So again, as I mentioned earlier, often more often than not as parents, we are very harsh on ourselves. So have a little bit of compassion with yourself. And what I mean by that is you, you can follow certain things to help you be a more compassionate person towards yourself. And often I feel like we very quickly talk um, or will be compassionate to other people if they're mean or something we justify why they were doing that and we don't have the same like compassion towards ourselves so first of all you have to pause and notice your thoughts try to spot when you're being hard on yourself for example you might tell yourself that you're a bad parent after you've lost your temper with your toddler um, but ask yourself is what I'm telling myself true or is this just what I'm feeling now? Would I speak this way to a friend or to my husband? Think about it a little bit. Because you're not going to tell your partner how you're a bad parent. Unless they really are. <laughs> but I'm pretty sure you wouldn't. So think of those things. First of all, pause and notice your thoughts. Remind yourself that raising children is big and important job. We, as parents, we learn as we go. We try and do our best for our children, but sometimes we make mistakes. 
And that's absolutely, again, reminding you that you don't want to be the perfect parent. Um, or there's no such thing as a perfect parent. You can only do the best you can, but you don't want to be that perfect parent because you're setting unrealistic expectations for everyone in the future. Another thing, the last thing is to also to say something kind to yourself every day. Um, and I am very sure in each of your lives, there is an opportunity every day of something that you did good as a parent. Even if it's just like, oh, that was a great hug. Well done. That's all you needed to do. Um, but it seems like I have Dr. Yakumin Miller back again. So I can ask my uh, questions again, because I was now mentioning a little bit of self-compassion and taking care of yourself, um, if you've missed it, Yakumin. But I did indeed. <laughs> <laughs> moving away from the self-compassion um, and getting into a last question of the subsequent, if we are emotionally well, our children will feel that as well. And that brings me to another point of, of positive parenting. First of all, what is positive parenting? Is it being okay. positive all the time? <laughs> no, absolutely not. <laughs> Nobody is positive all the time because they're all they're lying. <laughs> okay, so positive parenting is focusing and nurturing the good in your child and focusing on the good in your child instead of constantly focusing only on the negative and trying to correct the negative in your child, which is, I think, unfortunately what most parents do because this is how we were raised as well. Um, so, for example, instead of scolding your child for making a messy room, you praise, you catch the good behavior, in other words, and you praise the good behavior. And so when they do tidy up, you praise them extensively about that, for that behavior um, so that they learn that this is the behavior that I need to emulate and this is yeah. what I need to do. Whereas the bad behavior, in inverted commas, air quotes, the bad behavior, like having a messy room, for example, um, if you're constantly scolding the child, you're essentially constantly telling them, um, I don't want to say that they're bad, but it's essentially they they can internalize that this is this is bad behavior, I'm acting badly. And if, if it's a really um, toxic family system, it can even go to the point where the child says, I am bad. Um, whereas if you focus on the good and you, you praise the good and you nurture that which is the strengths of your child, that is positive parenting. And I think quite often that's what parents don't know. If you ask a child, if you ask a parent, what is the strengths of your child? Sometimes the parents really struggle to get to five things, even three things. Whereas if you ask them, what is bad in your child? Like what, what bad behaviors? They can list like a hundred. Um, and so it's a mindset shift to focus on that which is positive in your child and nurturing their strengths. That is essentially what positive parents. And I mean, it's so for me, it's a nice thing. And I mean, I'm also, and I've said this before on my show is that sometimes I feel like I'm only complaining. And in the end, I do love my children and I do love being a parent as well. And I do feel that I'm, I'm good at it. I'm, I might not be great at it all the time, but I do feel I'm good at it. And that positive feeling is really something because I'm a very empathetic person. So if I'm constantly surrounded and often people think, oh, because you can relate to people's feelings, but sometimes I take it on as well. So if someone is really negative around me all the time, I become very negative. And my children are a lot like that as well. So if I'm in a bad mood, consequently, they are also in a bad mood. And that, so I feel that we should rather try to feed off that emotion as well and trying to create, because as soon as I then start, you know, making that mind shift, I feel it has a mind shift for my children as well. So I love the it idea a, of it. <laughs> and it has a well-being component as well, because if we are focusing on the positive, we're recognizing the positive, we're seeing and nurturing the positive. There's a positive influence, not just on your child, but on you as well. And child well-being is also very important for parental well-being. Yes. And vice versa. Of and course. so, it, yeah, it's a reciprocal thing, but it does help you to feel better about parenting because it can suck. <laughs> it can be really difficult and conflicting draining, emotions tiring, all the time. <laughs> conflicting emotions all the time. And this is the reality because we are individuals who have our own desires and wishes, but we are also parents with a primary responsibility towards our children. And the two don't often walk a, a linear path together <laughs> no. 
But Yakumin, my very last thing that I want to just segue into is, I guess it's on the same note, is that for me, as parents these days as well, that I think it's the invention of the cell phone. It's really like, you know, you can be physically attached to your child, but you can be completely not there where you're in a completely different place. And that Emotion. brings me to the point of attachment. And how do we ensure, because in, in, inevitably to ensure proper childhood development, you need a secure attachment with your child. That we know. But how can we ensure that attachment with our children, with all the distractions, I guess, <laughs> in this day? <laughs> <and age? laughs> yeah, and so obviously your child, <laughs> attachment is very and there's there's a lot that goes into it. That would have to be a, a whole separate, a whole different show. We should really do a whole that. different show. Um, but just shortly, um, presence is obviously important, a very important factor. But you can have working parents who are working away from home who still have a secure attachment with their child. What matters is that when you are with your child, it is the child feels safe and nurtured, and seen, and loved. And you as parent receive input from the child as well. And when we're looking at attachment, we, we want children to feel safe, but to also feel confident to enable them to explore the world. So there's different types of attachment and secure attachment is where children know that they are safe and loved and cared for but have the confidence to leave their parents and go and explore the world because they know that should something happen, their parents are there for them. What we don't want to do is helicopter parenting, essentially, um, or what they call lawnmower parenting as well these days, is we don't, our fears can influence our children's fears and anxiety. And if we are constantly saying, no, don't go there, no, don't do this, your child internalizes those fear and anxieties as well. And so then it impacts their ability to go beyond the parent and live life and explore life, knowing that the parent is there for them in return. So it's a fine balancing act. But essentially for attachment, what you want is present, present mindfulness and seeing your child and respecting your child and responding to your child, um, meeting their needs but also allowing them to move beyond you as a person into their own lives. And I'm not telling you to now go and let your child explore outside on their own in the street. That's not safe. Um, but if they want to go and see if they can climb a tree, if it's safe, let them climb the tree. They need to also make some mistakes to learn from them. If we're constantly there to catch them or stop them from exploring in the first place, they don't learn and they don't grow and they don't um, so we do want the children to feel safe, but confident to move away from us, knowing that we are there for them, should they need us. There's a journey between a baby and adulthood, and we are part, I guess, of that journey and creating those independent people. It's not a, always an in, uh, uh, easy journey, but I think it's been very insightful and it's I've been reminded again of lots of things and I hope I'm going to remember them later when I see my children. Um, thank you so much, Yakumin, for joining me. It was very insightful. And I mean, you can see that you have a PhD in psychology because your calmness and clearness is a lot better than mine. And I love that. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so much for joining me today. It was fantastic. Um, it was an absolute pleasure. So as I mentioned earlier, in the end of the days, more often than not, we can be very hard on ourselves as parents. So take the time to be compassionate towards yourself as well and take care and pause and notice your own thoughts. Remind yourself that raising children is a big and important job and we are still learning as we go along. I said to you before that um, the way I did things initially and how I've grown as a parent, as a partner has changed and I'm constantly still learning and remind yourself that that's also okay. And remind yourself and be kind to yourself and 
say something kind to yourself every day. I mean, stupid mantras or it works. I can honestly, looking at yourself in the mirror every day and having a, like a power stance, like a superhero power stance and saying, you are great or you are a good parent or you care and have your own mantra. It works and do it. But as I said, it's been fantastic to have you today. The world is changed by our example, not by our opinion. So let's lead by example for our children. Thank you so much for joining me today. Until next time, enjoy your day. <laughs>